Okay, we've got this, uh, the candy all done on here that uh, Chris did literally last night, so it sat all night long. Didn't really have to. For me to come in and do the drop shot, I could have done almost immediately. Uh, for unmasking, I always recommend uh, waiting for it to completely dry so you don't get any wet paint anywhere on it. Uh, I'm going to come in and do, like I said, the drop shadows, and I'm not going to do them in normal black. I'm going to use the Candy 2.0 Candy Black. And the reason I do that is Candy Black is very, very transparent, similar to a drop shadow. Sometimes with black, you can just kill a piece by just dominating with a drop shadow. The drop shadow is like the most important thing in the image and you don't want that. So we want to be real subtle. The transparency of the candy black will allow some of the color from underneath to come through which again is more natural with a shadow. And uh, you know the fact that it is a violety transparent black, it's not going to react weirdly and change any underlying colors in any way that's going to get weird. Like a blue black may turn a yellow green so you have green drop shadows. It won't make any sense. So uh, I've already pre-mixed it. Uh, I pretty much, uh, on this one, just did a uh, kind of a one-to-one -one mixture. I know it's kind of heavy on the candy, but I don't, with drop shadows, I don't want to come back over and have to do it four coats like you would a normal candy. So I went one-to-one -one with like maybe 5%, 4011. You don't need a lot of reducer on this. I'm using my Clip CS and I let it sit for 15 minutes. Uh, I, I keep on saying this throughout the videos. Very, very important. Uh, and this is not just Kratex paints. In all honesty, this is like an ongoing thing with all water-based systems. These should sit for 15 minutes once you've mixed them, incorporated them. So now, every time you add a little bit of reducer to it, do you have to wait another 15 minutes? No, no, just the one time. Don't, don't go crazy on me here. So when looking at a hood, I know how this hood is gonna be placed. On a car, it's, of course, you know, a hood. You know, this is the front, that's the back. This will probably be hung with this down and this up, at least I hope so, so that devil's gonna be aiming down. But I always like taking into consideration drop shadows. On a car, these should be down and towards the back to show movement. If you put the drop shadows in front, it makes it look like the light source is in the back. You always want your light source in the front of the car and a little bit ahead. That, it just makes the car look faster. It makes the flames look better. Drop shadows should always go longer and lower than the flames. Um, I have no flames here, but with graphics, I'm doing it. Now, the tricky part comes on a hood. Because on the side of a car, you know what side is down, and you know what side is back. On the hood of a car, we know what's back. This would be drop shadowed because it's going back. This would be drop shadowed back here, but, and then I go on this side, and usually on a car, you keep it all the same. All of a sudden, we're over here. Should I be drop shadowing on this side? I go, that's assuming the sun's over there. The sun is right there in the middle. So I'm gonna have my drop shadows to this side of this graphic and behind this side here. And I'll probably bring it up and just stop it. I won't bring it all the way up here because the drop shadow for this would actually be kind of hidden behind this. And then the double itself, normally I'd put a drop shadow in front of it, but that's if the light was behind it. I'm gonna have the drop shadow just a little bit behind the horns and to this side. This one's, he's in the center, I can pick which one. So I'm gonna go with his orientation down because the way he's standing. So the drop shadow will be this side and back. You may think I'm going overkill on this description. You need to think these things through, otherwise you'll be done with the job and you'll have two drop shadows on both sides of the object. And some people say, oh, it doesn't make any difference, it looks good. No, it doesn't. Even a, a, a person who doesn't even know what they're looking at will say, well, that, something looks wrong there. You'll lose all your depth, the part of your brain that says, ooh, it's a shadow, therefore it is floating, will be gone, and now it looks like, ooh, that's something that has black sprayed around it. I see this done so many times. If you're gonna do a drop shadow, do it right, or don't do it at all. We could do this without drop shadows. Very, very 70s and 80s. Drop shadows didn't really come into play till the 90s. And uh, so if, you want, if you're not sure about your own drop shadow skills, then don't do them. Or make sure you clear the entire vehicle and then come in and maybe try doing your own drop shadows. If they don't look good, you can always wipe them off, you know, because it's on, on top of clear. So I don't tell people not to experiment, but don't do things that can ruin all your work if you're not sure of it. Never go into something not knowing what you're doing. Even if it takes me pra practicing on the wall or on another panel, do that. I do test panels every day, not just for me, for my freaking client that may not know what he wants. And I, he describes something to him, I paint it like this, oh no, I don't want that. Exactly what he asked for, not what he wanted. So send me a drop shadows, you know, right tool for the right job. So got my Eclipse CS here. I don't really need to turn the booth on to crank it up. It'll be fine. I got about oh, 30, 40 PSI in there, that's fine. Let's try, do a little drop shell that's easy to do. This one right here and just test. I, I, I notice I test on the tape where it doesn't matter. Then I can come in and go all the way down. What I don't want is the drop shadow to be spitting and stuttering. So I, I, I do a little test on the tape to make sure my airbrush isn't doing that Morse code thing. And then I come along here and then I fade this one out. Fade it out 
before it gets to here because then that's the opposite drop shadow. Over here it's a little bit trickier. We're going to fade it before we get to the tip. But we're going to extend it below this edge and then come over. Very softly. Don't mask off your drop shadows unless, I mean, I've seen people that do double masking. If you want a real clean Patrick Nagel look to it, you can go ahead and, 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 and mask off your drop shadow. That's kind of a cool, funky Art Deco look to it, you know? If you ever know, see Patrick Nagel's work, you know what I'm talking about. The most natural one is just to do it this, by freehand. And it does take some practice. For all you, those people that say, oh, I hate practicing dagger strokes. Guess what a dagger stroke is? It's your freaking drop shadow. And the hood kind of extends down here. It has a lip. So I'll make sure I get that lip. Don't skip it. If you're working on the actual hood of a car, be careful about that inside air. You may want to open it up or have the hood off the car. If you have the hood off the car, you can actually um, uh, do the back side of things. Now I'm going to come along here. If you couldn't see that because of the table, I'll do it over here again for you guys. Like I wasn't going to do the other side of the hood. And then I disappear it. You know, since this is going backwards, I could actually come down here and do this. It's kind of disappeared, then it comes out because that is casting that shot up. So, and then this one. I actually go away. Not all drop shots have to be up against the edge. By doing this, I call it a kick. I do the shadow and then I lift it away from, because if you think about it, the shadow is nothing but a duplicate of this. Don't do a big heavy drop shadow all the way out here. That's not casting a thick drop shadow, it's casting a thin one. By doing that, it gives an added impression of that design kicking out a little bit. It's kind of neat. Drop shadow here, again, let's flip flop. We're on the other side now. And we got a little bit of a, a slot, a slotted graphic that they're great for really punching drop shadows. Go a little bit further down. And I come down here to do the back side. While I'm down here, I'm going to do the same thing here and same thing there. So I don't have to go back down there again and break my knees. Okay, here we go. And that one. A little bit there. And this guy goes all the way. Whole way. Now for those of you who say, I thought you didn't want to go back and forth over and over your drop shadow. That's why you made this stuff pretty strong. You're always going to go over it. I'm talking about going over it 20 times. There's a difference. This guy here, if you can see him good, I'm going to go ahead and do the drop shadow on him on this side, just this side of the hand, this side of the bell. The bell here gets it. The flame gets it. That flame gets it. If it helps to say it out loud, oh, don't forget his chin. Oh, let's do the pitchfork. It actually makes you look at the image as a design, as an actual, instead of just like a bunch of masking tape that you don't know what it is, you make it actual personal. Like, okay, it's his head. This is his hand. It sounds silly. But by doing that, you think more analytically. You'll actually, okay, that's what the foot's supposed to look like. So I got to do that. Oh, that's the leg. It's got a drop shadow. Oh, that's the tail. It's got one on this side. When you're actually specifying stuff, I'm not, I'm not saying talk to your painting, but if it helps, go for it. By actually thinking about what you're painting as more than just a cons, more than just a bunch of shapes, as an actual entity, you'll be surprised at how much better you'll be at painting it. Because as you're painting it, you'll think, oh, well, that doesn't look that way. Or in reality, that doesn't look that way. It's a way of getting both your right and your left brain involved in the design process. If you do something over and over and over again, and you've done it a million times, you'll make dumb mistakes. What happens is your, your left brain takes over, and your right brain, your creative part, gives up and goes to the zoo. And then you make silly mistakes as your right brain and left brain together are the only ones that actually can understand an object, both in reality and in, like you can say, fiction, you know, what you're painting. And it's, that connection is pretty important. Sounds kind of woo-woo and sound of weird, trust me, it actually works. You always want to dialogue your designs so that you can see them both in negative and positive and you can see them in, in uh, left and right brain. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I, don't, I think I might do a little more shadow right here just to darken that up a bit. Remember, you can always add more shadow. Not easy to take away shadow, so don't do 
too much. And always look, go back over, see if you miss one. It's super easy. I miss them all the time. I've been doing this for years. So make sure you don't miss anything. I ain't miss anything. I don't think so. No, we're good to go. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and have Chris uh, unmask this whole thing. And then I'm going to show you a neat little uh, trick on getting rid of those really sharp edges that uh, sometimes you got to literally clear coat and sand to get rid of. And it doesn't eliminate them, but it's a neat little, uh, neat little trick, neat little tool that um, I've used for years. So I'm going to have Chris unmask this, and, uh, and then we'll be right back with, uh, with uh, getting on to the next step. And you'll see what that is. Well, we got Chris uh, unmasked the hood for me, um, which was very nice of him, and it came out really cool. I have a few little bleeds here and there, and you can always take care of those or touch them up, and, but I was really, really happy with the way it came out. Now, working with candies, we have a pretty high edge on this hood, and there's two ways about uh, clearing it or dealing with that. You can either just go ahead and clear it, and then sand the edges down, in which case the only thing you're sanding is the edges, which are going to be pinstriped anyway, and then you stripe it and you clear it again, uh, which is usually the way we've always done it. but. A lot of people will turn around and take a razor blade and just by hand, very carefully scraping the edge of the paint. Uh, it's a little nerve wracking, only a few people do it by hand. I have a couple of my good friends, you know who you are that do it and they're badasses about it. Um, but uh, I, I developed, uh, I've seen it, uh, little tools here and there that have worked and not worked. And then working with my son uh, from Simon Fraser Designs, his new 3D printing company started, we developed a little handheld device, it's 3D printed and uh, it's got a little spring loaded blade in there and we use the orange plastic blades. You can also use the blue blades uh, that are available out there and uh, it works really well as a scraper uh, to scraping off these graphics. It slides along and doesn't, you know, and it kind of has enough give so it's not going to dig in too much and you can stop it before it does. I do have a metal blade that comes with these. We're going to start manufacturing and selling these through Airbrush Paint Direct with probably within the next month. Uh, this uh, is the metal version of the blade which works actually really good on hardened clear and uh, hard surfaces but you want to be careful with it on fresh paint because the tensi will dig in a little bit more so uh, they'll each come with a couple of spare plastic blades and the one metal contoured blade which is it's a it's a razor blade but you can't it's been dulled you know it's it's still got a edge to it but it's not you know what I mean so anyway I'll show you how this works real quick and get another angle so the camera can see it we got a pretty good size edge right here and I just kind of drag the the scraper along till it catches the edge and if you can zoom in, you can see the little curl that's peeling up right there. And every now and then it'll lose it and you can kind of back up and re-scrape. And the trick is to come at an angle. You don't want to go dead on. You come at a, a little bit of an angle. And right there, can I still feel the edge? Yeah, barely, but it's not enough to really hurt a pinstripe. Because when I'm talking about hurting the pinstripe, I mean, look at that right there. This, this is all the paint I just scraped from one edge right here and I could probably come back in and do a few more passes. If I feel it catching and it won't damage it. And it's got a little padded surface on the bottom. Every now and then you want to clean that to make sure it doesn't grab any metallics. But works really nice. That right there is a good enough edge to, to pinstripe and you won't have any peaking. The peaking is the, the problem where it'll peek through and then if you're sanding and buffing later on, if there's a peak under that pinstripe edge, all of a sudden it looks like you have two pinstripes, a little color in between, that paint coming through. Major, major pain in the butt. And, uh, and right there, you'll just safely removes that edge without nicking, damaging, as you see, scuffing or scratching, both both sides. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish scraping the rest of this hood, get it all ready, and then I'm going to come in, do a little airbrushing inside the devil, and then it's pinstripe time. Okay, I went over the whole design using my edge scraper. We're using the plastic blade. Now, um, this, uh, I think uh, Chris put a little bit of heat on this just to dry it last night. And the only thing I'll recommend when using the edge scraper, get to it before you heat it because this works best when the paint is, doesn't work best good when the paint's wet or, or soft, but when the paint's really hard, it's a little bit tougher uh, to use it with the, the use a scraper. A little bit cleaner on here. But you can see there's a couple areas and you may think, oh, I, it, it dug too deep right here. There was actually a piece of tape stuck underneath here that caught, so the edge scraper also will help you catch the tape. Now some people think, well if the tape's buried, leave it. 
Never leave tape buried, and I'll tell you why. There's an emulsifying agent in all vinyl and crepe tapes that eventually will creep to the surface. It'll actually, what keeps that tape flexible will gas out and start eating away the clear, and that's why tape will always eventually come to the surface. Stickers eventually come to the surface on your clear motorcycles. Same thing with tape. Any, any calendared or cast vinyl adhesive, if you bury it in the clear, it will come back to haunt you later on. Not to mention you can burn through it with a buffer real easily. So the scraper serves a double, dual purpose. Besides cleaning up the edges and getting them to a manageable level, it doesn't remove them. Don't try and eliminate them. It takes off that peak that'll poke through. And uh, besides dropping it to a, manage a manageable level, it also will like, oh, I didn't even notice there's a piece of tape there. Kind of, kind of grabbed it, and I was going over real lightly. That's the reason it's got the spring-loaded feature. Let just the weight take care of it. Um, so this is all, all ready. I wiped it down, got all the, the little spare chunkies off of it. And uh, there's a couple of areas, there's a bug right there. There's a couple of areas that um, when unmasking got damaged, the drop shadow. You can come back in with the drop shadow with your air, same, I, that's why I kept the paint in the airbrush. And I can come in and clean up that drop shadow right there on the back of that so you won't even notice that one area. Now you may be thinking, oh, don't you're, you need to mask off your violet. No, you're ruining it. This, this, this candy black is mostly <laughs> violet. It's just a dark, dark violet. So a little bit, it's not going to hurt anything. I'm just going making sure. Now right here, I've got a light green color and that blue. I do not want to do, to risk the overspray getting on that. So I will come in, dull the tape a little and mask that area right there and lightly come back in this is like a little hair or something got right in the way there and you can see it in the drop shadow so kind of clean that up so this is the opportunity you get for cleaning it up now let's say a little bit of overspray got on here and you're like oh what do you do it, it's water-based paint Take in, uh, don't use any solvent, just use a rag with a little bit of water on it, just pure water, not 4011, not 4020, just water, and it'll take it right off within the first five minutes. So if you get any bleeds, it's not that big a deal to, 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 to uh, deal with it. If you have a bleed that sits for a long time and eats into the paint, removing it, sometimes all of a sudden you'll be like, man, the blue's coming up too. Well, the blue's already kind of crept into it. That situation, you can either come back and respray that, mask it off, or you can always do what we call hot spots, little white psh, streaks on there, and we always repair the, a lot of sins with uh, extra graphics. Um, we used to make a joke saying uh, a good custom painter will make a mistake and cover it up, and you'll never know what happened. A great custom painter makes a mistake and charges more for it. So be that great custom painter. Uh, before I actually do my striping, I've got all this kind of cleaned up. We had a, a couple little edges that were really nasty on this devil. And if you see some of the lift areas right here, that's not gonna matter. I've got an eighth of an inch black pinstripe coming in here. So this pinstriping is all approximately eighth of an inch. So when I see these little nicks and chips, people freak out. I'm like, it's gone. It's gonna be gone as soon as you put the pinstripe in. So I want to come in, and this is gonna be like a chrome looking devil. I'm not gonna make it really fancy chrome. I just want it to be a little bit of a hint of it. So I've got some Kareeb blue, and I'm gonna come in and just kind of fog it just a little bit on the top part of this design. Not taking into account any of the details that are going in it. Just a little bit of that. I know where his arm comes back at. I've done this design a few times. A little bit on the tail right there, not much. The leg, a little bit back here. Just a little bit of a halo of that blue to kind of give it that blue devil look. And if you're wondering where that came from, well, this is Tim Campbell's, this is a copy of Tim Campbell's graphics on his boat, Hell's Bells 2. And if you want to zoom in real quick, that's the little devil design that I did uh, for his boat, a little logo that's right in front of the letters. And that's where I'll come in and do all of that black line work. And you can zoom in close, you can see the, the blue's just a slight halo. Doesn't take a lot for the brain to say chrome. A Little bit of blue over the silver with the contrast of that orange in the background. And you can see the colors I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use the yellow on this. I'm gonna use the blue on this pink one. I'm gonna use an, uh, lime green on the, on, the, on, the, on the violet over here. So I'm pretty much gonna duplicate all the graphics that we did on that boat. But uh, got that blue in there now, now it's time to actually get my striping brushes and my paint out and start striping it.
Okay, got this all nice and wiped down and uh, dug up my reference image, the little devil I did on the original uh, boat by Tim Campbell. And all it was is just really outlined in black. Now, if I really want to, I could come in and maybe sketch this all out in like a grease pencil real lightly so I could see it. It's pretty simplistic and I can, I've done it a couple times, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and just, you know, letter it out. Uh, the striping paint I'm going to use, normally if I'm clear coat and I use, we'll use like a house of color or a base coat urethane striping paint, but in many situations, uh, one shot works out just fine. One shot is really the best on top of clear, but you can clear coat it. Now, a little hint for you when clearing one shot, make sure you catalyze the one shot. And I add a little bit of catalyst in the reducer I'm using here. And, uh, and make sure it's the same catalyst that your clear top coat's going to be going on. It gives a little bit of a commonality. And then uh, I'll always give it like a day to fully cure, like 12 or 24 hours. Then even so, when I clear coat it, I won't just go on wet with the clear. I'll do like a tack coat, probably three tack coats coats separated by a few minutes and then a wet coat and that gives a barrier. And the reason you're doing this is there's a, there's a dissimilarity between the enamel uh, striping paint of uh, the oil-based modified alkyd enamel which is one shot and uh, base coats are even lacquers back in the day. They'll have a tendency of reactivating. So you want to be really careful with that. But other than that, it's a, for pulling uh, and long pulling you know, lines and, and smooth flowing uh, brushwork, you can't beat one shot. So uh, we're going to go ahead and use some of that for the black and I just have a little liner quill that I grabbed out of this box of brushes, exact same one I've used on a couple other videos already. And I'm using a, a magazine over here to palette on just to get a nice feel for the brush. And then I'll come in and uh, try it out on an area that I can maybe see if I like the line work on it. Yeah, it's a little bit on the thick, thin side. Let me thick it up a little bit. And I'm not going to make this really, really very thin lines because I want it to be viewed from a distance decently. And I'm just going to keep on outlining this devil till I get it all done. And notice I'm working from the top back. Uh, because the paint's going to stay, stay wet for quite a while, so I want to make sure that I'm not... If I started back here, I might be laying my arm in it, so I'm going to work in this area up here first, and it keeps my hand out of the paint. If you have a mall stick, which is like a little stick you can use to hold your hand above the working area, it's like you'll lean a stick and your arm rests on it. You can do that too, I just don't have one of those right here. I don't really need it for something this small. I can just use wrist action, which I'm just using just to kind of hold the, the brush in the right position. Nice thing about going over water base, if I make a mistake, I can wipe it off a lot easier than if I'm going over solvent base, because this paint, it is going to lock in, it's going to be more of a mechanical tooth than a chemical. It's not going to eat in chemically into this surface. So I can come in and wipe it off with very little damage, it's kind of one of the little advantages to use in water base in this situation. Now, um, if this wasn't one shot, it would already be dry. I could lean on it and touch it. You always have to remember, I know your paint you're working with. This takes a little bit longer, usually about anywhere from a half hour to an hour before you can actually touch it. Whereas it's usually five minutes with, uh, with your thing, especially in the, the heat with all these lights in here. So I got to avoid this guy. He's all done. You can check him out. He came out pretty cool and uh, just carefully just went from that direction to this direction. Now, uh, whenever striping, you always want to think um, sequentially you need to stripe. Like if I'm going to be striping a graphic and another graphic goes over it, I want to stripe the graphic that's furthest in the back. The reason being is, like for instance, down here on this yellow, I want to make sure I stripe this before I do the magenta because I can butt up to that and then the magenta stripe will go on top of that or whatever stripe I, color I choose for the thing is violet goes here, will go on top of that. Otherwise, it's really tough to butt stripes up exactly one another. So I always want to do the one in the background first, then that one. So this one touches nothing. So why wouldn't I do this one first? Well, because my hand is here when I'm striping. This will be wet. So I'm going to do this one. Then I'm going to do this one. Then I'm going to do the blue one right here because it's underneath the green. Then I'm going to do the green. Be really careful to avoid the blue. Then I'm going to do the, the hot pink, the porn star pink graphic here, but from the outside. I'll do it from the front so I, my hand is on the outside of that. 
you need to think of that not just for because you have some paint that's still wet but it's there's always something up there's always your paint you're using the design you're doing the situation it always requires being strategic. So the color I'm going to do on this one is the exact same color. I don't need to select colors. I'm just copying what I did on the boat. Tim Campbell's boat, all of the violet tape shaded graphics on both sides of the boat uh, got a lime green pinstripe. In this situation, I'm using the um, emerald green uh, one shot. Didn't add anything to it, just have it in the cup. And uh, the way I do it, I don't pre-mix my colors with catalyst and reducer. I put catalyst and reducer in a separate cup. I dip and go back and forth in palette. And that's how I incorporate the, the reducer and the catalyst and the, and the quantity that feels good. People say, well, how do you tell? I'm just feeling a certain type of tension on the brush when you're palleting. So palleting serves two purposes. And by the way, the brush I'm doing here is a little bit different than the lettering quill I used here. This is called a striping brush. This one is actually made by uh, Mac brushes and it's called a MAC-10. This is a single aught brush. Uh, you need to kind of trim these when you get them, but they're pretty close. They're not as, as shaggy as, as the green ferrule. You're looking for that blue ferrule there. And you always want this stick to be facing to the left. So if you're a right-hander, your thumb goes where that stick is. If you're a left-hander, your pointer finger goes there. So this stick is always facing left because you can tell this is the blade uh, you know, the part you're striping with, but when this is covered in paint, you can't tell which side is which. So always remember, flat side to your left. I'm going to dip it in some reducer first, then I dip it in the paint and I palette it back and forth on the magazine. Now I used to always ask a trivial question to people, it's like, well, what, when would you use a magazine and when would you use a phone book? And the thing is, is that in uh, really, really cold weather, you use the phone book because the phone book's more absorptive and it pulls some of that reducer out in cold weather. In hot weather, you, you, you need as much reducer as possible in there, so you use a magazine. So, neat little trick there. And I press down a little bit more and I can get a little bit more width out of that brush. And I basically I'm just going to continue until I get this violet graphic done. Then I'm going to clean the, gr the brush out real good and go on to the next color, which is going to be, uh, for this color right here, it's going to be a blue. We're going to do a blue on that yellow. All the way down to the back. Now, I usually press really hard when I'm striping on these things just because I got a little nerve damage on the right hand, so I can't really feel my hand very easily. So I press real hard, and that's how I know the a pressure point I have for the, the, um, the brush. Now, unfortunately, on this thing, this moves. <laughs> so as you can see, it's like, you know, I got that, like, yeah, it's like, it's that really high quality uh, metal. But um, it's just, it's not a real hood. It's a, you know, a little demo hood, but gotta be careful not to press too hard. Okay, got the last color on here, which was the violet stripe around the outside edge of that porn star pink. If you notice, remember those little chunks that were missing? They're all gone. Uh, eighth inch pinstripe heals all matters of sins on graphics. Uh, matter of fact, I still am a firm believer that pinstripe was invented to hide bad tape edges. Uh, the same way inlaid wood was, was invented to hide bad wood grain. But uh, got it pretty much all finished. It is not an exact duplicate, but pretty dang close representation of Tim Campbell's Hell's Bells 2 boat that, as I mentioned earlier, is still holding the points uh, lead right now. Uh, so knock on wood, we don't jinx it with that. Uh, top alcohol hydro came out killer. Entire boat was done in Craytex. This entire hood was done in Craytex. And uh, the only thing left to do is going to be to clear coat it. And that will be done by Chris Arpin. Uh, as soon as we let this sit for about a day, well, I want 24 hours on this pinstriping before we actually clear it. He's going to come in then and put a couple of nice gloss coats on here, probably color sand and buff it when it's done. And this is going to be hanging up in the corporate headquarters here at Craytex Colors. So hope you enjoyed this. We touched a little bit on everything from a simple layout pinstripe mural uh, design drop shadows, graphics, sequential masking, tape shades, stencil use, candies, sparkle essence, iridescence, 
silver sealers we pretty much use it all on here uh, if you have any other questions I did not answer in this video please go to createxcolorstech.com uh, or check out the YouTube channel but until then and uh, the real finish will be Chris finishing this up and taking it outside in the sun for some photographs uh, my name is Craig Frazier and from Createx Colors here in Connecticut I will see you next time Hey guys, we are outside and uh, we got a couple coats of clear on this thing and uh, it's looking really good. Unfortunately, Craig had to hop back on a plane to go home, so he left me to uh, show it off for you guys. And I think this is also a good testament to that shaver tool that he did have and use. These lines are almost non-existent, so even for one session of clear, this thing's looking really good. So you could probably leave it just like that. So uh, I think that wraps up this project. Thanks again. Big thanks to Craig Fraser for being out here and uh, we'll see you guys next time.